Punch newspaper changes President Buhari's title to Major General. Nigeria Customs Service intercepts dangerous sex drugs with a duty paid value of almost a billion naira. On the international scene, Britain's elections come up tomorrow, but there are issues beyond Brexit that divide the electorate. And in sport, South Africa pulls out a bid to host 2023 Women's World Cup. This is ANN News. I am Olajuwo Keolatanji. The current political situation in the country is bringing out different reactions and comments from different circles. The latest is the Punch newspaper, which has announced it to stop addressing President Muhammad Buhari as president, but as Major General. The newspaper published a column in which it stated it would now put the president's military rank before his name. The Punch says it would not only refer to the president by his rank, which he says was a military dictator in the 1980s. It would also refer to his administration as a regime. The newspaper says it will revert to the civilian title after, quote, they purge themselves of their insufferable contempt for the rule of law, end quote. The National Daily says its decision was purred by certain events, including the DSS non-compliance with court orders in the trial of Sahara Reporters newspaper publisher, Homoyale Shoure, the courtroom invasion by armed DSS operatives, and the trial of Shiite leader, Ibrahim El Zagzaki. Reacting to those developments, Senior Special Assistant to the President on Media and Publicity, Femi Adesino, said the newspaper decision to call President Buhari Major General is not out of order, since he actually earned the rank of Major General. Adesino further said the publication by Punch is proof of press freedom under the Buhari administration. The family field in the nation's number one public house in Asarok has gone beyond just a spot. First Lady Dr. Aisha Buhari appears ready to dock it out with the president's nephew, Mamam Dara, whom she accused of allegedly issuing presidential directives behind her husband. Mrs. Buhari made the allegation in a statement released to reporters in Abuja on Wednesday. In it, she said Dara allegedly issued a directive to presidential spokesperson Garbashew not to recognize her office. The feud between the two worsened in October when Aisha Buhari returned from a foreign trip and was locked out of her office at Aso Rock. Her statement says Dara had shifted his loyalty from the president to others whom she said have no stake in what she calls the president's compact with Nigerians when he was elected in 2015 and 2019, respectively. Mrs. Buhari said the office of the First Lady is a tradition that has become an institution. She said even without a bodice, she has been able to raise necessary funds to run her humanitarian programs. Mamandara and Garbashew have not commented on the First Lady's statement. Pandemonium has seized um, the Asian town of Ipokia in Ogun State. Youths accusing the police of beating a young man to death on Tuesday took to the streets this morning to protest against the alleged killing. Eyewitnesses said the deceased man, popularly called Alakma, died after being beaten by the police with the butts of their guns. The Rate youths have barricaded the main road in Ipokia, charging the police with extrajudicial killing. Although state public Relations officer Abimbola Oyeyemi has denied the youth's claim that the man was beaten to death by the police. She said Alapa slumped at the police station but died in the hospital. An association of nearly 22,000 disengaged teachers in Kaduna State has cried out for the payment of the members' entitlements after two years of their termination. The disengaged teachers said they have been experiencing untold hardship because of their endless wait for the benefits. They said these entitlements include outstanding salaries for different months, leave grants that date back years, gratuity and other benefits. The teachers said many of their members had died while waiting for the payment, while some others who are sick are unable to afford treatment. They also said some have lost their residences when they could not afford to pay the rent. They have openly appealed to Governor Elrafai to intervene. 
The Center for Democracy and Development has condemned the social media bill which has passed second reading in the Senate. The group says the bill was an attempt to use legislative process to stop freedom of expression in Nigeria. CDD Director Idayat Hazan released the statement in which the group called on the Senate to disregard the entire bill and look for alternative approaches to the problem of hate speech and the spread of false information in social media. The statement further said a number of draconian provisions in the bill empowers the Nigerian government to unilaterally shut down social media and possibly the internet for posts they deem to pose risk for public safety and national security. The group said this would pose a serious threat to Nigeria's democracy and freedom of speech. The group suggests the government should focus on improving digital and civic literacy at all levels of society to give its citizens the skills and knowledge to decide for themselves what is true and what is false. The Nigerian Customs Service Sokoto Area Command has intercepted and seized more than 600 cartons of dangerous and unapproved sex enhancement drugs, a fraud sex with due to paid value of nearly a billion naira. Command spokesman Magaji Malafia discussed this in a statement. He said that drugs, which are also known as Lady Killer or AK-47, were seized in late November after a tip-off. He said the command had also seized some jerry cans of vegetable oil, cartons of tiger head partridge, and 86 sacks of monosodium glutamate in the Achida Goronyo axis. It also seized seven sacks of 800 cutlasses per sack at Ilela. Coming up, African news. Johannesburg and surrounding cities are inundated by flood waters, even as more rains are predicted. And later, international stories. Britain braces for very key elections tomorrow. <sighs> this used to be me. But that was before I got the perfect bag. It's handy and easy to use. All I need in one compact space, just like my MTN Extra Value Plan. I used to get one plan for my calls and then try to remember which data plan worked for me. Roaming was a totally different ball game. Not anymore. I've got the MTN Extra Value All-in-One Plan. If you're a data buff like me, you get extra data with some talk time. And if you like to make calls, you get extra talk time with some data. And when I'm abroad, I automatically browse, chat, and call right on the same plan. MTN Extra Value was made just for me. More of data or calls, whichever one you prefer. MTN Extra Value is made just for you. More rain is predicted for flooded Johannesburg and Pretoria. The persistent rain in parts of Houting has left areas in the city of Twane flooded. Parts of Centurion, south of Pretoria, and Mamalodi are submerged as water levels rise in lower lying areas. Reporter Angela Coppola has more details. The rain also played a role in the nationwide blackouts, as at least two ESCOM power stations were affected. At Creel, there was flooding at the mine and at the power station. And at Camden Power Station, they had 25 centimeters of rain in one week, which flooded the boiler and turbine hall. The whole situation started uh, last week, uh, if I'm not making a mistake, on the second uh, last week, where we had uh, an upper system that was throwing a tropical moisture uh, down to our central and the eastern part of the country as a result of uh, scattered and widespread showers and thunder shower. Residents were caught unawares when the water swept through their areas. We only have two roads actually to get to the other side. There's a couple of cars that went through, the helicopter was rescuing people. So it's actually quite bad at this stage. And a lot of people were displaced uh, that live near the river banks. There's about 60 of them that were seeking shelter at the moment. These floods have actually wreaked uh, serious havoc for the city. Everywhere there are floods. and. Um, as councillors, it's part of our duty to make sure that our people are safe and secure. We've seen cars drowning, uh, we've seen cars being swept uh, by, the, by the waters, and, and also some of the shakes, especially in Mamilodi uh, parts, the, 
they've been shot by the waters. The flooding has highlighted several infrastructure issues in the Tswane area. Volunteers have been working to clean up the river of pollution for years now. They worked during the worst of the deluge and helped those less fortunate. So over the weekend we arranged a clean up where we did um, 657 bags that we removed from the river and uh, that equates to more or less 25,000 kilograms. Um, and then the floods came and I went down the road from where I live just to go and see what was happening with the people who live in the compound, the recycling compound um, there and it was devastating. The houses were washed away completely, people were just in the streets, they had nothing, they were soaking wet, it was, it was horrendous. After every storm there's the sunlight and then the opportunity to rebuild and restart, especially for those less fortunate, until the next storm breaks. The International Court of Justice has opened a three-day hearing on Tuesday on a genocide case filed against Myanmar by the Gambia in which it accused Myanmar of violating the 1948 Genocide Convention. It has filed the case on behalf of 57 members of the Organization for Islamic Cooperation. The Gambia has charged Myanmar's military with brutally cracking down of Rohingya Muslims in 2017 forcing more than 700,000 Rohingyas to flee across the border into Bangladesh. A UN investigation in which survivors of the alleged genocide were interviewed says the Myanmar campaign was carried out with genocidal intent. Survivors gave numerous accounts of massacres, extrajudicial killings, gang rapes and the torching of entire villages. In his opening statement, the Gambian Justice Minister Abubakar Tambadou asked to the court to tell Myanmar to stop what he called senseless killings and acts of barbarity. Myanmar will be defended at the IJC by de facto leader Hong San Kuo Kien in her official role as foreign minister when she addresses the court on Wednesday. It is expected she would reiterate her government's claim that the military was targeting Rohingya militants. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has been vigorously pursuing economic reforms in the country since it took office. His policies are aimed at attracting direct foreign investments into the country, but there are two sectors of the economy that have been reserved solely for domestic investors. Reporter Grim Chale has the story. Since Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power, Ethiopia's economic reform has been high on his priority list and just recently a new investment policy has been adopted by the council of ministers this policy unlike expectations of many however reserves the banking and insurance sectors only for locals but why from uh, the discussion that we've had from the research that we have done uh, we have not come to a conclusion that the liberalization of the financial sector at this point in time is right course of action that needs to be taken and hence we have reserved the financial sector uh, for Ethiopian nationals uh, but you know a reform has also been added to this element where Ethiopian diasporas can actually now invest in the financial sector the aviation industry is similarly left for locals currently domestic investors can actually invest in the aviation industry but for foreigners it's only allowed in joint venture with the government. So basically it means when Ethiopian Airlines is ready for a joint venture arrangement, the government can make a change to the, can, can, can decide to form such uh, uh, arrangement. Initially and in hoping the finance and aviation sectors will open up the space has generated lots of interest from regional and international banks. The investment commissioner Abeba Abebayo says Ethiopia needs a time before it deeply involves foreign investors in its most lucrative sectors. It's the question of, you know, answering that fundamental question. Is our economy ready to absorb and this competition that's going to come from uh, foreign banks, number one. Number two, will allowing foreign banks and foreign uh, foreigners in this industry help the agenda of sustaining the growth of uh, the Ethiopian economy? If that's answered in the affirmative, I think it's only a matter of time before the liberalization of this sector. But there is a good news for investors who would like to put their money in other business environments of the country. Addis Ababa is putting together what will become one of the finest investment incentive proclamations.
certain types of incentives that have been in the past abused without serving any particular policy objectives will be rationalized and any loopholes that made it difficult for investors to benefit from the existing regime will also be addressed through this investment uh, regulation. So it's about streamlining the incentives. It's about rationalizing the incentives. It's about also making it extremely transparent and predictable for investors to be able to make use of the incentives that the country provides. The new Ethiopian investment policy is expected to attract many more foreign investors. So far, the country has been on average garnering an investment worth about 4.5 billion US dollars yearly over the past few years. Now, Ethiopia hopes that number could exceed $5 billion of investment. When we return international news, Britain prepares for tomorrow's landmark elections that would spell out the future of Brexit. And later, sports. South Africa pulls out a bid to host 2023 Women's World Cup. It is the final day of campaigning before Thursday's UK general elections, and party leaders are focusing on key messages surrounding National Health Service and Brexit. The vote is set to begin early in the morning. Residents in the northern coastal city of Sunderland are concerned about the crunch election with many locals feeling ignored by the London elite and in fear about the potential consequences of Brexit. U.S. House Democratic leaders have unveiled two articles of impeachment against President Donald Trump, charging him with abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jared Nadler says Democrats had to take action because Trump had endangered the U.S. Constitution. He is also accused of undermining the integrity of next year's election and jeopardizing national security. Nadler says Trump sees himself as above the law and no one is above the law. The House Judiciary Committee is expected to vote this week on the formal charges after which it goes to the full House for a flawed vote. While on the one hand, articles of impeachment were being unveiled against President Trump, he was also being handed a win by the same House that is impeaching him. The House is voting into law the new U.S., Canada and Mexico trade pact the President had negotiated to replace the North American Free Trade Agreement. It took months of negotiations for House Democrats to bring the new North American Trade Pact to a vote. The new provisions would strengthen the trade deal protections for workers. The signing ceremony in Mexico City launched what may be the final approval efforts for Donald Trump's three-year quest to revamp the 1994 North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. A deal he has blamed for the loss of millions of U.S. manufacturing jobs. The U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement was signed more than a year ago to replace NAFTA. But Democrats controlling the U.S. House of Representatives insisted on major changes to labor and environmental enforcement before bringing it to a vote. Sadly, a police officer and five other persons were killed in a series of gun battles in Jersey City in the U.S. state of New Jersey. Reports say two other police officers were wounded during the incident, which ended in a shootout after two gunmen barricaded themselves in a cautious supermarket. Several local schools and businesses were also put on temporary lockdown. A motive for the incident is not yet known, but investigators believe the location was targeted. Authorities identified the deceased police officer as 39-year-old Joseph Seals, who was part of a statewide program to confiscate illegal weaponry. Police confirmed two more officers and a civilian were wounded in the shootout, but are reported to be in stable condition. Still to come, sports. South Africa pulls out a bid to host 2023 Women's World Cup. Please stay with us. Supergoose German coach Gerda Raw has dismissed claims. He refers on the national team Redden FC midfielder Ovier Ejarie to Queen's Park Rangers forward Ibele Chiesi. Ross cleared the air on the Super Eagles Twitter handle saying he has never compared players and never asked the Nigeria Football Federation to make any overtures to the players in question. As South Africa is no longer in the race to host the 2023 Women's World Cup tournament because of the country's current economic instability. The country's football association, SAFA, says 
It wants to focus on improving the women's game, particularly the fledgling National League, before bidding for any international tournament. South Africa is suffering through an economic crisis with several of its state entities in trouble, like electricity, railways, and the national airline. SAFA says spending government money on a sports tournament at this time would likely not sit well with many.